So some vocabulary words coming up, and this is what I want you to take a picture of. So I would suggest putting these all on one page so it's easy to do. First, I'm going to show you a diagram of the temple. You do not need to draw this. Matter of fact, it's probably too detailed for our purposes. This is a sketch that I downloaded probably 20 years ago and have found to be pretty useful. It gives a sense of the different parts of this, the temple built by Solomon, um, or at least the temple that Jesus would have known in his time. And I'm going to point out some features of it here. In the centermost part of the temple is the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, the Sanctum Sanctorum. You don't need to write these down yet. I'll give you a list in a second. Outside of that is just the holy place. Outside of that is the court of priests. Sorry, that's a little awkward to read. Outside of that is the court of Israel. Outside of that is the court of the women. And then the outermost part of the temple is the court of the Gentiles. Please spell that word correctly. G-E-N-T-I-L-E-S. If you want to draw something, and I think this is worth drawing, not necessary, I would suggest you draw it as a, like an onion, which has layers. And the innermost part of the temple, again, I'm going to put the terms up here in a second, would be the Holy of Holies. Outside of that would be the court of the Levites or the court of the priests. Outside of that would be the court of Israel. Outside of that would be the court of the women. And then finally the court of the Gentiles. So I'm going to list them right here and you can begin writing some definitions for them. So the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant would have been kept at the time that the Israelites had it. And even after the Ark of the Covenant disappears from the Bible, the Holy of Holies is still seen as the dwelling place of God, the holiest part of the temple. And only one person could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. And the high priest could only go in there on one day of the year, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement in which the priest would go into the presence of God and ask for forgiveness for the whole community. And that was the one day a year when the priest would come out in front of the people and actually speak God's name. And the Holy of Holies was separated from the rest of the temple by a giant curtain that went from ceiling to floor. And when the high priest would go into that part of the Holy of Holies, the tradition was that somebody would tie a rope around him so that if he died, they could pull him out without having to enter into God's presence themselves. And that's significant to understand because in Matthew 27, let me click here, jump over to the Bible. In Matthew chapter 27, we have the story of the death of Jesus. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus, who is up on the cross, cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are actually the opening words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's some conversation among the people about what Jesus is saying. Verse 50 but Jesus cries out again in a loud voice and gives up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earthquake and rocks were split. So we've got a nice little footnote here. The veil of the sanctuary, that the death of Jesus rips apart that curtain that would have separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And the symbolism is that when Jesus dies, access to God is now opened up to everyone. You don't have to be the high priest in order to come into the presence of God. So in order to understand that little passage from the New Testament, it's important to look at um, the structure of the temple built by Solomon or understand the structure of the temple built by Solomon so that the significance of that um, shines forth. 
So that's the Holy of Holies. And I can go through the rest of these a little bit quicker. The court of the Levites, and I will again pull up my other diagram, is where the actual rituals of the temple would take place. There's a wash basin where the priests would purify their hands. There was the altar of Holocaust where they would burn animals or grain offerings. There was an altar of incense that would have been in this area. There would have been a table with offerings to God, uh, bread and wine and fruits and vegetables possibly. And only those from the tribe of Levi, only the priests could go into that part of the temple and do the rituals. And if you were a Levite, you could not go into the Holy of Holies unless you were the high priest and unless it was the Day of Atonement. And then the court of Israel, again, a layer further out, and I think the circles work better, is where the men of Israel could stand and they could watch the rituals take place from up, up front. Kind of like courtside seats at a Blazers game that the men of Israel had the opportunity to see things happening up close while the women were segregated to the back. They could see, but they were in the general admission section. Um, but if you were an Israelite woman, you could actually go further into the temple than a non-Jew. And there are some older synagogues today that still have a structure where there's a balcony area for women and children and the men sit up front. In some uh, Jewish traditions, in order to have public worship, it is required to have 10 men come together, a minion, and women don't count towards that total. Some Jewish traditions do allow women to count towards the minion. And in some ways, thankfully, in the Christian tradition, the physical separation of worship by men and women hasn't been overly apparent unless you're a woman with children who's in the crying room in the back of the church or on the side of the church. But uh, historically in the Christian tradition, the wealthy people who could afford to buy pews and chairs would sit up front in the church area and all the poor people would stand in the back. So um, every traditionist struggled with these uh, distinctions between the front row people and the back row people. And the outermost part of the temple would be the court of the Gentiles. And please spell that word correctly. It's G-E-N-T-I-L-E-S. And the word Gentile means a non-Jew. So the temple that the Israelites worshipped in until it was destroyed in 70 CE assumed that people who were not Jewish might come there to worship as well. And in the time of Jesus, this outermost part of the temple was a large outdoor courtyard. And if you recall, the reason why people would go to the temple or the uh, way in which people would worship when we went to the temple was to offer holocausts. And if you were a Jewish family coming in from the countryside, bringing your own sheep for 30 or 40 miles to sacrifice it was probably not a real practical thing to do. So you could buy sheep as you got closer. And there were apparently even stalls in here where you could buy doves or incense or different things in order to offer your sacrifice in the temple. And as you know, if you've gone to a Blazers game, the price of a soda in the Rose Quarter is a lot more expensive than the price of a soda outside of the Rose Quarter. So I'm sure as one got closer and closer to the temple, the price of the animals for offerings got more and more expensive. And if you were somebody who... Um, sold animals in this area of the temple. You could command top dollar for them. Um, and the people who ran the temple, the Levites who ran at the time of Jesus, probably charged a pretty hefty fee or took a percentage of whatever profits these stalls made. So kind of picture a Saturday market where people have um, cranked up the prices on religious articles and animals for sacrifice. Of course, if you're coming in from out of town, you would not be able to use your foreign currency. You'd have to change that money for some local currency. 
and the people who might have money changers tables here would probably also charge you quite a bit of money. And the prospect for corruption and uh, profiteering would be um, pretty high. You would, and the Levites who run the place, getting a cut of that would be um, motive, would not be motivated to encourage you to lower your price. So here I'm going to click on my other hyperlink and go back to the Bible, Matthew 21, six chapters before the previous one that we read. Um, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. That's a passage connected to the prophet Zechariah. And after Jesus has entered into the city of Jerusalem with people singing and shouting Hosanna, he immediately goes to the temple and begins to drive out those engaged in selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. That's actually a quote from the prophet Jeremiah who said the exact same thing outside the temple in Jerusalem about 500 years before Jesus. And Jeremiah was imprisoned by the temple police for doing this and put in stocks overnight and beaten up by the people for daring to challenge the religious authorities. So this is where Jesus would have thrown his fit in the temple, flipping over tables, and it's not surprising that within a week Jesus is executed.